new videos every day. Hi, I'm John Breeding. It's Wednesday, December 8th in Austin, Texas. Glad to be back. I haven't done a video for a while. But I came across an article a little while back. It was in April, actually, on the psychologytoday.com website. And it's called, Why Don't Psychiatrists Notice When Patients Experience Medication Side Effects? Looking at over 300 patients in a listing of a whole host of side effects, it found that, that, a st that the average number of side effects reported by patients was 20 times higher than that recorded by psychiatrists. This, our, the authors of the article called it a stunning disconnect between psychiatrists and their patients. Later on, they said there was a chasm of misunderstanding. They asked, why? Why is there such a massive disconnect? Do psychiatrists not ask enough questions? Do psychiatrists not dig deep enough? Are psychiatrists not hearing? Certainly that's one aspect that's generally consistent with the teachings on perception and denial. You know, that we see the world not as it is, but as we are. And then we act according to that understanding that we tend to perceive things that we look for and not perceive things that we aren't looking for. We tend to perceive reality in a way that validates our pre-existing beliefs. And that's definitely true in psychiatry. They're doing a practice. They're believing in it. They're not going to look for and pay attention and communicate adequately with data that shows it's not working. It's the same reason why this massive data that Robert Whitaker's collected in Anatomy and Epid Epidemic that shows basically that the drugs don't work generally, that they make things worse over time generally, is data that is unknown or denied by psychiatry at large. So that's one big piece. But they also ask, maybe it's the patient. Maybe patients are reluctant to speak candidly to their doctors, or maybe they freeze up, right? Well, this is valid too, you know, and uh, it reminds me of uh, all the studies in psychology about uh, deference to authority and obedience to authority and conforming to authority and a fear around confronting authority. People are conditioned to be timid around doctors and authorities, and so that's something that we all have to challenge inside of ourselves, right? They also say, or is it the situation that is to blame, right? Well, we know a lot about that from psychology, too. The famous experiments by Stanley Philip Zimbardo in the prison experiment where subjects became prisoners or guards and got so into those roles that that situation evoked basically sadistic behavior on the part of the guards and passive freaked out behavior on the part of the prisoners. Same thing in terms of the atrocity producing situations like the prisons and the American military prisons in Iraq or Afghanistan where the soldiers end up torturing and killing prisoners, detainees, not because they're sadistic soldiers, but because it's an atrocity producing situation. In this case, a situation where there's an authority and a hierarchy distorts relationships. This is one of the basic problems with this whole doctor-patient deal, with this whole hierarchical d dynamic, where instead of two individuals relating to each other, you've got this expert and this not expert, this mentally ill person, this mentally sick person, and it creates a power differential that's just distorting and perverting. So all these things are general influences. But I got a couple of more specific examples relevant to psychiatry. One of them I wrote about in my book, The Necessity of Madness, in the section on electroshock, because it was a study by Benedict and Sachs back in the late 80s, looking at the regulation of professional behavior on shock in Massachusetts. It found approximately 90% of ECT patients received shock inappropriately. Okay, well that's bad enough, but listen to this. The authors also reported that, quote, the more familiar a psychiatrist was with threatened or instituted lawsuits involving ECT 
and the more likely a lawsuit was thought to be, the greater was his or her departure from the guidelines. The more they felt oversight, intervention, ethics, probes, the worse they got. There's something about this in terms of the way ethics work. When you're out of ethics, when you're doing things that aren't good, and there's a threat of oversight, you actually over-justify and get even worse out of a kind of a defensiveness and an aggressive counter-response. So when you're in a situation that's inherently unethical and not based on science and, and does more damage than good, which the data validates what I just said, that, you know, psychiatric diagnoses are not based on science and treatments are not based on science. It's based on PR and it's a belief system. And the data shows that those treatments don't work. So there you are doing something that's basically out of line and out of ethics, and you're going to not be able to perceive the reality that contradicts that. In fact, you're going to consciously or unconsciously refuse. That's a big part of what's going on. Lastly, in January of 2010, there was an article in the, United, the New York Times, actually, by Ethan Waters called The Americanization of Mental Illness. And he was looking at how this whole biological psychiatry model, this whole idea of all these mental illnesses that are biologically and genetically based, that whole model in the pharmacological and electroshock treatment of those is spreading to the rest of the world. And that's part of what the article is about. But one of the interesting things in there was uh, that one of the justifications for this disease model, it's the same thing with the disease model in the addictions field, is that it protects people from blame and shame. So, you know, when you say you have a disease, you know, oh, it's not your fault. You're not to blame. You don't need to feel guilty or unworthy. You just have this biological or genetic defect. It's just an unfortunate defect, right? And so it's supposed to protect from stigma. There's no shame about it, right? Well, Sheila Mehta of Auburn in 1997 did a study that was very interesting where they fed uh, the subjects of the study information about people they were working with. So it was a setup, you know, kind of like Stanley Milgram's famous shock experiments where they told the subject that this was about learning, but really it was about whether the subject would obey the experimenter and increasingly electroshock this fake learner who got things wrong deliberately. And so you would shock them in increasing numbers, presumably to look at the effects of punishment on learning. But really it was to see whether the subject would obey the authority figure, even when it meant inflicting pain and dangerous harm on somebody. And the shocking results were that, yes, people obeyed authority, you know. And so this was similar to that, except that what they did was they had the subjects either believe that the learner had problems because of their biologically based mental illness, or they had problems because of their struggle with life situations that was more psychologically and socially based. Well, guess what? The subjects punished the people more severely when they thought that their defect was biologically or genetically based, that their problems were due to a biological or genetic defect. The very thing that was supposed to cause less stigma and more sympathy actually led to more hostility and more punishing kind of behavior. And then also this was looked at, generally speaking, in other social experiments in other countries where they found that people who thought that that patient was sick because of a biological or genetic defect, a mental illness that was biologically or genetically based, they actually distanced from the person more and isolated them more. So there was actually more stigma with the belief that mental illness was due to a biological or genetic defect. It exactly worked opposite. And in my mind, it makes sense because you're basically saying that's a defective individual and there seems to be a psychological vulnerability towards distancing some from defective individuals. 
I'm not saying it's right, but I'm saying that it's more of a defect to say that you've got a disease that's biologically or genetically based mental illness than it is to say that, you know, you've got some psychological and social turbulence because you go and been going through some stuff in life and you got to work with it. To me, that has to do with, oh, well, that's more of a human connection that I can relate to. And I might judge it or I might not like it, but I'm going to have more empathy for it. A stunning disconnect between psychiatry and people, a chasm of misunderstanding between mental health professionals and people. Yeah. We got to get out of this arrogant, superiority, professional attitude towards inferior people that we're helping. And definitely out of the view that these people are genetically and biologically defective. And so we're going to inflict these power interventions on them which, as we know, of course, is driven by the money flows of the pharmaceutical industry. There's no science in it at all. So in order to perceive reality more clearly, we need good data, beliefs that make more sense, and a willingness to confront all of this. So let's do it. If you liked this video, we have hundreds of more alternative videos ranging from sexual health to psychology to mind control. So if you liked it, go ahead and click on me to enter the Psyche Truth channel.